Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Immediately, Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law laid ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came, and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. I am not an old car guy. I mean, I like looking at old cars, but I'm not one to spend my free time with my hands uh, knee deep in motor oil and rust and wrenches. I am related to old car people. I know what they're like. It's a sickness that, thank God, I've avoided to this point. I know I have expensive ho uh, hobbies, but old cars are a very expensive hobby indeed. But I know this much. There's a rule that takes place. Something has to happen. You have to fix the car before you get to drive the car. The engine has to turn over. The brakes have to work. The lights need to function. The tires need to be safe. These are the minimals that must happen before you get to drive your old car. Jesus kind of works on the same principle here. Before he's going to get his knowledge out of his Christians, of proclaiming him and his message of love to the world, he's going to have to fix us Christians first. That's just the way it happens. We see it in our text today. He did not tell Peter's mother-in-law, we're hungry, and when you're done, I'll deal with your fever. Just the opposite. It was an amazing 50th wedding anniversary, as 50th wedding anniversaries go. Both families were invited, black tie, formal wear only. The catering was top notch. The priory in the middle of the city was full. The big band orchestra was playing the most amazing music. The bar was open to everybody. It was an amazing event to say the least. But there was a lot of talk amongst the guests. A lot of confusion, in fact. Because they were very confused because this 50th wedding anniversary was the couple's first date. I thought you would have to date, marry, children, life, all that stuff to get to 50th. But they decided to skip to the end, as it were. Enjoy it all at once on their first date. It sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? That's how it works, right? I mean, your first dates were that way, correct? Huh? Mary, you remember very clearly, right? Yes. Man, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, five-piece orchestra cost me a fortune. Of course not. Things happen in order. They happen in a certain order for a certain reason. And that's just the way it is. That's how it works out. Poor Peter's mother-in-law. As a side note, it would seem that the very first pope was married. Uh-oh. We'll leave that go for now. I'm not here to do that kind of work. But just to keep in mind the implications. Or... Maybe Peter just had a mother-in-law without a bride. I doubt it very much. But this poor woman is sick and ill with a fever. This fever is a dangerous thing, especially in the ancient world. Something was going on. She was helpless in that bed. And there, when Jesus comes to the house, they point him first to this woman. And Jesus shows compassion. He grabs her by the hand. That's a loving act, isn't it? I have worked in 20 years to learn to grab people by their hands more, especially when they're sick. I use the uh, antibacterial first, I promise you. But there's something about it, something human to human touch. He grabs her, and in her helpless state, he lifts her up. He heals her. And then she gets up and does what I consider the most normal of all the normal things I've seen in the church. She goes to work immediately. 
doesn't she? The men and women of Christ go to work immediately. We've been saved. We've been freed. We've been released from the curse of sin and death and the devil. And now we're ready to work the, the, uh, the way things go. Christ saves us and now we get to live out our faith, not the other way around. Evangelism doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. We like you to be morally upright and act like a Christian, and then we'll get around to, to actually conversion. It has to be that way. It always has been that way. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult sometimes. I know the need, and I've seen people knee-deep in the need, like Peter's mother-in-law, hurting physically, emotionally, spiritually, and really, as they wallow in it, there's only Christ who can come into that situation and change things. But we've all been there, needing a Savior, and Christ has come to each and every one of us. There was a young boy named Thomas. Thomas went to school. Thomas liked school. The teacher wrote a little note home to mom. The note was simple this, and remember this is back a, day, back a while. Teachers don't write notes like these anymore. The note was, your son Thomas is too dumb. We cannot help him in any way. Mrs. Uh, so, Mrs. Edison wrote a note back to the teacher saying, I know Thomas. You don't. I will raise him. I will educate him and I will teach him. And so, young Thomas Edison was raised at home with a mother who was also his teacher who understood his ways. Doesn't surprise me at all. Sometimes I think that's the way Christ looks at us. The world goes, eh, not them. Rejecting. You guys, no, no thank you. And Jesus looks at us and goes, I'll take them. I'll take the rejected. I'll take the lost, the weak, the, the pain. Those who are lost, I'll take them. The woman on the bed dying, Jesus is like, that's the woman I want to talk to. It is this type of Savior that we have. The world says, no, thank you, and he says, this is the people I want. The people who, uh, who are lost. The people who are damned. The people who cannot live holy lives. Those are the people Jesus is looking for. The weak, the useless, to quote the teacher, even the dumb. Jesus looks for those people. And he re the people rejected by this world will become saved by a man who was also rejected by this world. The world never had kind words for Jesus, and he doesn't have a lot of kind words for us either. So be it. But we've been saved. We've been healed. We are now God's children. And now that you're saved, forgiven, loved by God, now what in your lives? Well, I think Peter's mother-in-law did it best. She got up and she started to serve. We get up and we serve. We serve Jesus. We serve his family. We serve his church. We serve each other. We serve. That really is the motto of the church in a lot of ways. We serve. And not for our own personal glory. How many times writing out this sermon did I have to write Peter's mother-in-law. I wish I knew the woman's name. It would have been a lot easier to write this sermon. It's actually easier than mother-in-law over and over again. We have no idea the woman's name, but we know that she served Christ faithfully. And that is the way of Christianity, is it not? New York Times a while back got a lot of women's groups in New York and they were going to do the 12 greatest women in the United States. They threw out the article after a while because they realized, and the women's group even said, the women that are the 12 greatest women in the United States, nobody knows who they are outside their own home. Isn't that true? 
Okay, who's the greatest president of the United States in your mind? Who taught that person to read? I'm guessing a woman. I'm guessing that's a very important person. We don't know. The church is 2,000 years old. We have millions upon millions of people today on this earth confessing Christ and millions upon millions who have died in the faith of Christ and we do not know their name. They have gone in the midst of history. They are gone from all eternity in our minds at least. Even if I sat down and tried to name the top Christian leaders and people with all my education, I would peter out pretty quick and I wouldn't even get to a thousand, much less a million people. But I could tell you one thing, Jesus knows Peter's mother-in-law's name. I could tell you another. Jesus knows the millions upon millions who call his name. And those who have died in his faith, Jesus knows them too. He came to save those people and he knows us and saves us. You are not insignificant to the work of God. In fact, you're critical. No one is impressed with a photograph of an old rusty car, are they? I'm not. But when you go to someone's house and they open the garage door and there is an immaculate, perfectly restored car, you sit there and then you're like, that's a good looking car. And then when they pull out the photograph in the glove box of what it looked like before, now you're impressed. Our Lord Jesus does the same thing with you. He's got the before and the after. And the after is who you are today, and it's impressive. Maybe the world's not impressed. Who cares? The church is impressed. Our society needs us. And Christ himself is very impressed because you are his work, his love. He died to save you, to recreate you. We are now his children. I'll leave you with one little final note here that I've said many times, and unfortunately it's on video, so I might get in trouble. If I lose my job, it's because of this next statement. I'm not worried. Lutherans have never been opposed to good works. We only want to get it in the right order. Jesus saves us first, and him alone does the saving. And now that we are God's children, we now live to serve. That's it. Not that complicated, is it? I do like Peter's mother-in-law. She reminds me of the hundreds of women I've met in the church in the last 20 years who serve because they love the Lord that much. Serve the Lord your God, for he has rescued you from sin, death, and the devil. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds on Christ Jesus. Amen.